Good morning. I'm in Luke chapter 18. Love for you to join me there. Luke chapter 18. What a week we had last week with Vacation Bible School. Thanks so much to, to all who helped and who worked so hard to get all of that. I told them it's amazing that you worked for three or four days to get it all put together and then it all came down like a couple of hours, right? And it's just poof, gone. Uh, but it was a great four days. Uh, I think 124 was the lowest number of kids throughout the week and made it over 130 a couple of times during the week. And so just a great week. A lot of, a lot of seeds, no doubt, that were sown and I appreciate Jeff's prayer so much. And uh, we do pray that those seeds will come to fruition in the coming years. Many of you adults came and attended the adult class, heard a lot of great things about the teachers in the adult class, and I'm very thankful for that, very thankful for your support. And then yesterday, to, to be able to uh, impact the lives of some young people and families and the school supply giveaway, I was, I was shocked, and maybe you heard this, or, or maybe I didn't even say it, I don't remember, but in my conversation with Don Williams down at the children's home, he told me that it costs roughly $500 per child to get them ready for school. And so that's what we were raising money for this week was to send to the children's home to help them with school preparations. And I realize that that's not all paper and books and, and, and school supplies. There's also shoes and clothes and that type of thing. Uh, but the reality of it is is that it costs a lot of money. And it's just difficult for some families. And so uh, if you were here yesterday, thank you. I, I got to see the pictures and the young people that were involved in that. And uh, just so very thankful for all that was done. And, and rest assured that if one family was impacted, it was worth it all. And so we're very thankful for you and for your work in that. In Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, we find the reason for our parable of interest. The Bible tells us in Luke 18 and verse 1 that Jesus told a parable that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. Not grow weary or not faint. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop short. That amazes me, the people you talk to, and they're just mad at God. They're, you know, they're upset and mad because God didn't do this or God didn't do that. Or you say, well, have you... Have you talked to him about it? Yeah, I prayed about it. And he, he still didn't do it. How many times did you pray about it? Well, just once. Really? Well, that's pretty impressive. You've been complaining for five years over something you prayed about once. What's, what's not weighing out here, right? I mean, I mean, if you're only going to ask God to help one time, then if He don't, all you ought to be able to complain is one time, right? I mean, if we're just going to use simple logic and human thinking here, okay, so God didn't do it your way, so that gives you the right to complain for the rest of your life. No, it doesn't. Nothing gives you the right to complain at all, but it just amazes me how quickly you and I lose heart or how quickly we faint or how quickly we grow weary because we, we live in a, I, I call it a vending machine society. And that's just going to be my, my parallel forever, I guess. You put a quarter in. Well, you used to put a quarter in. Now you put $2 in, right? And you get a bag of chips out, right? You, you put some money in. You push a button and out comes what you want. And and. That's fine and great and dandy and whoever decided to put quarter bags of chips in a machine and charge $2 for them is a genius. But the point is, is that that affects how we think about everything else. And so we, we feel like that if we could just walk up to a machine and get what we want, then in the same way we can just walk up to God and get what we want. And, and you know what happens when the, when the little spinner thing kind of hangs up, right? You start shaking that dude and banging it, and, and, and your husband or wife is going to the nearest clerk at the desk saying, hey, this thing, right? You get angry. 
You get upset because it, it, didn't, it didn't give you, it didn't work like it was supposed to. And now all of a sudden you have, in your own mind, you have a right to fuss at a machine that nobody has any control over. But because you put your money into it and it didn't do what you want, and, and, and that's the way it happens with God. Something we have no control over, but because it doesn't dispense out the way we think it ought to dispense out, then all of a sudden we gain the right to shake it or bang on the glass or go complain to the nearest employee. And since God is a company of one, then we go complaining on Him. Jesus told a parable in Luke 18 that we are to pray and not grow weary or grow faint or lose heart. The goal of the parable is found in verse 8 of Luke chapter 18. And it's at the very end. Nevertheless, will the Son of Man, when He comes, find that faith on earth? When the Son of Man comes, will He find that faith on earth? That is the question, that is the goal of the parable. The one in which we will dive off into this evening, Lord willing, at 6 o'clock. Hope you'll be here analyzing what kind of faith it is that God is looking for, and then asking ourselves personally, will He find it? The, the goal of the parable is not justice. That's the goal of the widow. But not the goal of the parable. The goal of the parable is to produce the faith that the Son of Man is looking for when He comes. And so in order to produce that faith, we back up to the purpose. Pray and do not grow weary. Verse 1, faint not. So he tells this parable. There was a judge, verse 2, in a certain city, and he neither feared God nor respected man. He's a pretty crummy citizen, isn't he? The first question I got is how did he get to be judge? Because he has no respect for God, which probably wasn't uncommon, but he has no respect for humans either. So how in the world does this man get into a position where he's judging matters between people when he has no respect for mankind either? Not only is he is he ungodly? He's almost unhuman, in a sense. That he doesn't even respect other people. Thus implying very clearly that in order to get what you want from this man, you better get ready to do something very unhuman. In other words, if you want to get out of this man what you want, then you better get ready to do something that is under the table, backwards, illegal. Call it a bribe. Call it trickery. Call it whatever you want to call it. Because you're not going to be able to go to him and say, well now, you know, this is just what's fair because he don't respect humans anyway. So why does he care what's fair? He has no value for justice to begin with. He doesn't have any appreciation for fairness. All he cares about, apparently, is himself. He doesn't have any respect for anyone else. And so as he engages in this widow coming, for a while, verse 4, he refuses her. Naturally, that's what anybody would do of a widow but especially a, a, an evil, unrespectful person like he. But afterward, verse 4, 
He thought within himself. He, he said to himself. He, he came to a, a thought process. I love it when the Bible kind of puts us inside of people to tell us what they're thinking. He, he thought to himself. And he even admits what Jesus tells us to describe him. It's not like Jesus said, hey, I don't really like this guy, so let me tell you all bad, I can tell you about it. No, he even says within himself, you know what, verse 4, I don't fear God. I mean, why would you admit that, number one? But then, to have the inward thought of what's going on in his mind, the fact that he's admitting to himself I don't fear God, and I don't respect man. Ultimately admitting, I don't owe this woman anything. I don't have to do anything for this woman. Yet because, verse 5, and there's only one reason, she keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she does not wear me down, beat me down continually by her coming. And the end of verse 5 literally says in the Greek, so that she doesn't give me a black eye. That's pretty cool. Do you really think this judge feared this woman coming up and punching him in the face? Of course not. He didn't, he didn't have any physical fear of her harming him, but that's what the text says. And so translators have really struggled with what's he really trying to say here? Well, what's the point that Jesus is after here? Well, she'll bother, wear me down, bring me down, wear me out, weary me, some translations say. In other words... The judge decides, I'll give her the justice she wants just so she'll leave me alone. Just, just get her out of my hair. Just, just do what she wants so that... Now this is a guy who has no fear for God. He has no respect for mankind. He has no sense of value to justice or fairness, yet because she just keeps on keeping on and keeping on, I'll do what she wants just to get her out of my head and get her out of my courtroom. If I don't, she's just going to wear me out. Now the other person involved in this parable is, is the widow. And what do we know about widows? Well, obviously, we know that she was married, right? And her husband's dead. So now she is not just a woman, but now she is a, a lady who has, a hus who has had a husband that had all the estate rights and heir rights and everything, but now she's lost that. So she literally has no standing. She would almost be better off to be just a, just a woman. But it's almost like it's one step worse to be, to be a widow. Not just a lady, but to be a widow lady. Because she had no guarantee of anything. She, she could be kicked out of her house. She could have everything that she thought she had partial ownership of taken away. I'm not saying that always happened. I'm just saying that it's possible. And, and apparently, somebody is doing something wrong to her because in verse 3, she keeps coming to the judge saying, give me justice against my, against my adversary. And we don't, know, we don't know who her adversary was. It could be somebody as close as her own son because he would have the right to take everything away from her. Isn't, isn't that kind of strange for us to think about? But he would have that right. So her adversary, the one that is treating her unfairly, could be someone as close kin as her own biological son. Or it 
might be a neighbor or it might be somebody. We don't know who it is. It might be somebody in town. But we don't know what she's being treated unfairly about. We just know that she is not getting the justice that she believes she deserves. And notice that she's, she's not asking for revenge. She's asking for justice. She's not saying, hey judge, this person has done me wrong. Now won't you go take their legs out from in under them? You know, let's get even here. Let's get back in it. No, she just wants done what is right. What is fair. She's not asking for any special treatment. She's asking for justice. Well, oftentimes, because, because I'm a child of God, God owes me some special treatment. God, God ought to treat me better than He does someone else because, I mean, after all, I'm trying to do what He wants me. She's not asking for any type of special treatment. She's just asking for what's fair, for justice to be served here. Notice from verse 5, she's persistent. She keeps coming. Remember the goal, or remember rather the purpose of the parable? The purpose of the parable is that we pray and faint. Now, here was a lady who illustrated by her actions persistence, perseverance, patience, not growing weary, not losing heart, not fainting. She kept coming, kept coming. How long? I have no clue. For whatever time passed, she made an impression on the judge. She kept coming that much. What was the outcome? Well, listen to verse 6. The Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. And will not God give justice to His elect who cry out to Him day or night? Will He delay long over them? I tell you, verse 8, He will give justice to them speedily, quickly. The, the, the verdict, the outcome is that the judge decided he would give justice. And obviously the contrast here is an unrighteous judge versus a righteous God. And if a man who has no fear for God and no respect for mankind, if he can understand the value of persistence and keeping on keeping on, surely a God who is respectful of mankind, who values justice, who understands fairness, who can see perseverance, surely that God would respond to one who perseveres. And the answer is absolutely so. Sure He does. Not just that He does, but that He does so quickly, that He does so speedily. Now be careful with that because now you want everything right out of the vending machine, right? you got to stop and realize that God hearing us is conditional on a few things on our end. First of all, God only hears those who hear Him. I don't know how familiar you are, and I may be about to offend you, but i I, got to be honest with you. Every time I hear any discussion about the sinner's prayer, number one, it's not in the Bible, but number two, I love John 9.31. The Bible said, Jesus says, God does not hear sinners pray. So the next time somebody says something to you about sinner's prayer, just say, well, I I just don't understand because God don't hear sinners. Now, you need to do a little study of John 9, okay? I'm using it out of context there a little bit. But hey, if they're going to make up a prayer that ain't in there, can I use a verse out of context? I mean, come on. What's fair is fair, right? You need to do a little context study, and you need to see that in John 9, Jesus is talking about the question of whether the man that was born blind was caught in sin or or because he sinned or did his parents sin or why was this man born blind? Jesus is saying he he was born blind to show you the power of God. You need to do a context study, okay? 
Obviously, there is none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If God doesn't really hear sinners, then He doesn't hear any of us. So if you take John 9, 31 at face value, then nobody can talk to God. We don't believe that. The Bible doesn't teach that. What the Bible does teach is that those who are going to talk to God must be willing to listen to God. Now we've got a different category of people. God's not going to allow people to talk to Him who aren't willing to listen to Him. Well, let me ask you, before you get mad at God, do you like to talk to people that won't listen to you? You just want to talk to people who aren't listening? You, you don't enjoy that, do you? Neither does God. Matthew seven twenty one. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Jesus is saying, listen, if you want God to hear you, you need to listen to Him. God will hear those who hear Him. But then let me also remind you that God will only hear those who ask in faith. Did you hear what? Jimmy read a while ago from James 1, beginning in verse 5. Verse 6 is really the key. If any man asks doubting, we must ask in faith. If you ask doubting, you're like a wave of the sea that is just driven and tossed about. Well, God, I, I, I don't know if you can or not, but hey, you know, could you hand one down? Right, God, I, I don't know if you're capable or not, but if you are capable, God doesn't hear people who doubt Him. He's, he's, he's not listening to people who aren't asking in faith. God, I, I, don't, I don't know if you're going to do this or not, but I am confident that you're able to do it. Now, that's faith. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen that way. But what it does mean is that you believe it can happen. And God says, I, I'm not going to listen to you if you, you're going to doubt me. A third thing I would remind you of very quickly is that God only hears people who are concerned with His will. Well, I prayed to God and I, I prayed to God and I prayed to God and I prayed to God and, and it, it didn't happen. What didn't happen? Well, God didn't answer my prayer. How do you know? Well, because he didn't do what I wanted him to do. Well, tough turkey. Last time I checked, God ain't on your time scale. And he ain't on mine. Last time I checked, God doesn't ride your train and he don't ride mine. We ride his. We're on his time scale. We're serving him. This is not a vending machine you walk up to expecting exactly the number you push to fall out. Have you ever pushed E5 and you got the thing out of B4? Well, you really feel good then, don't you? Crazy vending machine. I mean, you're kicking and screaming and fussing. And, I mean, if you wanted what was out of B4, you'd have pushed B4, not E5. We do the same thing with prayer. God, I didn't want it this way. I asked for it that way. And you've done it this way. How much do we truly believe Romans 8, 28? That all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. When's the last time we read Luke 22, verse 41, when Jesus went away a stone's throw and He knelt down and He prayed in Luke 22 and verse 42, Father... If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. God, God only hears those who ask accepting of His will. If you're not, if you're not asking according to the will of God, God's not hearing it may be that you need to change the perspective of your prayer. Pray and do not grow weary. 
Be persistent. Be constant. Persevere. Don't quit. Don't give up on God. This woman, she kept on. She kept on. And if she could move an unrighteous human, there is no doubt in my mind that you and I can move a righteous God. And what I mean by move is not get our way from God, but that we can cause God to act and move in people's lives and in circumstances and in situations to accomplish what is best for His purpose. when we are willing to listen to Him, when we ask in faith, when we ask according to His will and not ours, but then finally, let me remind you that God only hears those who are willing to forgive others. Matthew 6 makes it very clear in the model prayer there in about verse 12, Father, forgive us our debts as... We forgive others their debts against us. Verse 14 of Matthew 6 goes on to say that if we forgive others their trespasses, our Father in heaven will forgive us our trespasses. But verse 15 of Matthew 6 warns that if we don't forgive others, God won't forgive us. God only hears those who are willing to be forgiving of others. That's got to be who we are. Thus, while hanging on the cross, Jesus would say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen would say the same in Acts chapter 7, while being stoned. Father, forgive them. If Jesus and Stephen can request the forgiveness of those that were doing, surely you and I can request the forgiveness of those that are doing whatever to us, We must pray and not faint. Don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. Recognize there are conditions to God hearing us. Absolutely. Fulfill those conditions. Understand those conditions. Appreciate those conditions. Then and only then can we fully understand why it is that God may answer a prayer differently than what we ask. It's all about faith in Him. What is it that God is not responding quick enough for you right now? You've been asking. Oh, you've asked more than once because you're better people than that. You've asked a dozen times, two dozen times, three dozen times. You've lost count you've asked so many times. And it just, it just ain't happening. And in your mind, you're wondering, is God really answering this prayer or not? Let me tell you what He might be doing. He might be seeing how long you're going to hang on. Let me tell you what He might be doing. He might be trying to increase your faith. Let me tell you what He might be doing. He might be trying to help you develop a greater sense of gratitude when something happens that you've asked for. Because I'm telling you, if you're asking and it ain't happening, and you're keeping on asking, your faith's growing. Your trust in God, I hope it's growing. And when something does happen somewhere down the road, if it ever does, I promise you, you'll be a whole lot more thankful. Man, when I push the button and that vending machine gives me what I want, do you realize that I stand there for the next three and a half minutes thanking that machine for how great it's been to me? You do the same thing, don't you? We reach in there, we grab it, And we run, don't we? If we're not careful, we do the same thing with God. Don't be guilty of that. God may be trying to help you develop a little sense of gratitude. 
pray and faint not. I hope that's who you are. I hope that's what you're doing. And I hope God recognizes you on His terms and on His conditions. But if not, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.